Good morning, and welcome to the July 26th meeting of the Solon Board of Education. Mr. Bolden, will you call the roll, please? Yes. Ms. Thomas? Here. Mr. Heckman? Here. Ms. Glavin? Here. Mr. Patton? Here. Ms. Motes? Here. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the, the flag of the United States, States of America, of America. And, and to, to the, the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This will be our first opportunity for public comment. In accordance with Board Policy 0169, this meeting is a meeting of the Board of Education in public for the purpose of conducting the school district's business and is not to be considered a public community meeting. This is a time for public participation during the meeting. Each person addressing the board will give her, his or her name and address and will be allotted three minutes until the total time of 30 minutes is used. During that period, no person may speak twice until all who desire to speak have had the opportunity to do so. Individuals desiring more time should follow the procedure of the board to be placed on a regular agenda. The period of public participation may be extended by a vote of the majority of the board. In order for the board to fulfill its obligation to complete the planned agenda in an effective and efficient fashion, a maximum of 30 minutes of public participation will be permitted at each meeting. Board members do receive and review the agenda and accompanying explanation during the week prior to the Monday board meeting. If you would like to address the board, please step to the microphone and state your name and address, please. Um, I would like to say that what I'm going to do is, uh, in the interest of making sure everybody gets the opportunity to speak, um, if you could look to me, I will give you at one minute, two minutes, and three minutes. That way you can uh, time your uh, presentation accordingly. Okay. Um, Ashley Beavers, 6803 Glen Allen Avenue. Good morning. I am a concerned parent who spoke last month regarding how the DEI lessons made my child feel. Some of the statements she said were, why do I feel guilty for being white when it's beyond my control? I feel like I have to be a chameleon in the classroom. With public, com with public comment opportunity, I expressed my concerns and gave my child's perspective. I expected a response from the school because my child matters, regardless of what support you have for this training, but no one reached out. I want you to know that one of the next year's lessons is LGBTQIA, coupled with sexuality. Defined by Merriam-Webster Dictionary, it states, the quality or state of being sexual, the condition of having sex, sexual activity, expression, of sexual receptivity or interest, especially when excessive. How is this appropriate? It's not. It's not appropriate in any capacity. Why are you allowing the PTA to head this topic to our children? Or are you going to allow sexuality to be defined by some unknown group, like what you did with systematic racism? This is not part of the school curriculum. I want it on the record that I emailed Mr. Bolden on Tuesday and the assistant principal Frazier about both my concerns with sexuality lesson for this year and have received no response. I want to remind the school board of its duty. According to the school board's association, the most important responsibility of the school board is to employ a superintendent and hold them responsible for managing the schools. You help set district policy, adopting curriculum, engaging parents. You're supposed to build public support and lead the public in demanding quality education. In my opinion, you're not doing that. You're supposed to serve as a link between schools and the public. As Erin Short wrote in her 2020 letter, basically labeling all white parents racist, I'll use her statement. When parents come to you with concerns, are you going to keep your head in the sand? Your job is elected. You can be voted out for not doing your job. When parents come to you, you aren't supposed to brush it off and let Fred deal with it. You're supposed to engage. You aren't doing your job. I want you to know that I and a growing number of parents have started taking charge due to your lack of action. This flyer went out to the community over the weekend. It's original documents that were given to students during the DEA training in Aaron's letter. With that said, I'm sure they will make a decision on whether or not you should keep your job. But don't worry, the board meetings and hours were included so they too can express their feelings on the matter. I expect a response from the staff I emailed at a minimum when it concerns my child. Members of the board, please engage your parents and address the concerns, otherwise it will be taken to the community. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jordan Klein. Um, I'm at 32750 Aspen Glen Drive. Um, I'm an incoming sophomore at the high school and a member of the diversity committee. 
In middle school, I started to learn about discrimination and social justice by reading books like The Hate You Give, Dear Martin, and All American Boys. And I had discussions with classmates. I realized I wanted to make a difference, and over the past few years, I have engaged in various learning opportunities. I'm very fortunate to be a student at Solon, not only because the extracurriculars and academics are excellent, but also because there are people with many different backgrounds. The diversity at Solon is one of its top qualities. I have friends in many races, religions, and ethnicities. Learning about their cultures and traditions makes me more informed and a better friend. As a Jewish person myself, I truly appreciate when my friends ask me questions about my religion and culture. As a white student, I understand that the school needs to teach me about diversity and equity. I do not feel threatened when learning about systemic racism and the fact that white people traditionally benefit from policies and have throughout history. I believe learning is a key first step toward ensuring that everyone in society has these benefits. I do not feel uncomfortable or guilty when discussing these issues. I feel empowered to make a difference. When I talk with my friends after the classroom conversations, they agree that these discussions are, are critical and they appreciate that we can have these in a school setting. The conversations opens our mi open our mind to the world, especially after hearing statistics about unfair treatment and inequity. It's also important to note that the DEI lessons do not only cover the topic of racism, but also other topics or other issues that face teens, such as religion, xenophobia, and ableism. We learn to be accept accepting of differences and to advocate for those who can't necessarily advocate for themselves. I believe it is vital to continue these conversations at school as they help students understand each other and therefore have a more positive high school experience. And today's students are tomorrow's local and national leaders, so it's important to learn now. I hope the Board of Education continues its commitment to DEI education. Thank you. And my apologies for leaving the meeting early, but I have to go to band camp. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Katie Egan, and I live at 6958 Psalm Center Road. I'm the parent of three Roxbury students and have been an intervention specialist for Northeast Ohio Urban School District for 10 years. The first thing I would like to say is thank you for your incredible work through the first two months of virtual learning in April through June 2020. Your connection to students and communication with families was efficient and above and beyond. My job during those months was just attempting to connect with families and solidify phone numbers, addresses, and email addresses. I was not teaching. I was just trying to communicate important information to parents. Parent involvement and willingness for connection is taken for granted. It is not the norm everywhere. I thank you for your commitment to communication in a time of crisis. With that being said, it seems as though family was not as important to connect to when introducing borderline controversial subject matter in school this year. The concealing of curriculum written by a small group of parents and admin was at the forefront of the agenda, even though families repeatedly asked for access to the curriculum. I may not have a high school student yet, but that's only a few short years away. My confidence in transparency and union between school and home is dwindling. If families who want to be involved and a partner with the school are being rejected, what does that tell the students? It tells them that division with family is normal. Dividing student against parent when it comes to a curriculum that boasts inclusion is contradictory. I ask that moving forward, families be presented with curriculum surrounding DEI ahead of time, preferably at curriculum night in the fall. I also ask that the program be considered an opt-in instead of an opt-out. Though many of the principles of the DEI encourage much needed bias changing conversation, the way it has been presented this past year at the high school has created division. Many of the vocabulary terms have isolated students and caused fractures in student unity. At the last school board meeting, several residents attested to the fact that this curriculum was written due to student survey results. It was stated that students overwhelmingly wanted the DEI program, but 54 students asked for changes to be made, and 18 said they didn't like it at all. Only three out of the 184 students who made comments said they liked the curriculum as is. Nearly 40% of the comments suggested changes needed to be made to the curriculum. Students should not have to feel isolated by opting out, but instead all students should be given the choice to opt in. I also wanted to touch on the point of not engaging with families, doing to keep the conversations organic. Working for a school district that has adopted an inquiry-based method of teaching and learning, organic conversation is not had after a 45-minute prepared presentation. That presentation then skews the conversation with bias instead of posing an open-ended question or photo that sparks authentic conversation between students. Working for that same district, we could benefit from an open conversation about unity. These presentations may hold some value in promoting that. But at the last meeting, it was shared that Solon does not want this good work by the PTA and admins stolen from other districts. If the point of the curriculum is changing cultural bias, why keep it a secret? 
If the information is so crucial, why can't families in other districts see it? In closing, I ask that family be considered as the child's most important educator and that we be given the opportunity to know what our children are learning. Thank you. Hi, my name is Melissa Solano. I live at 7071 Liberty Road, and I'm coming to you somewhat with a per personal. Um, I'm a mother of um, Spanish children. My sister's children are black. We have a multiracial family. And um, we moved to Solon a few years ago, and, and the shocking thing with me is the more training and diversity I'm seeing come from this neighborhood, the more uh, separation and division is going on in this neighborhood. All you have to do is look in the community groups and look how the adults are teaching, are treating each other because of this. What is that going to do to the children if the adults are so offended by this and are fighting back and forth? It's something we should really think about. Um, so my family, we're, we're multiracial, and for the longest time, it was going forward. Now it's all this hate and division. What is going on? This is not how it was. And so I have to go to work, but I just wanted to say, look around at what this is doing to our community. People's houses are getting vandalized. Yeah, five people in this neighborhood, houses have been vandalized. Okay, we have got to stop this. This is getting ridiculous. So I, that's it. I have to go, thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Rebecca Wad. I'm at 31135 Cannon Road. I'm just here on a separate note to voice my support for a mask mandate for um, students that are under 12, mostly because they are all ineligible for the vaccine so that they don't have that added protection of being able to get the vaccine. And with the Delta variant right now, we are seeing that COVID is over 200% more transmissible and that it is causing young people to get sicker than they were previously. And these masks in schools for children that are unvaccinated would be their first line of protection. Um, we're also seeing a lot of breakthrough cases. So people that are vaccinated are getting sick due to the Delta variant. Um, so masking children that are unvaccinated would also help protect vaccinated and unvaccinated staff as well. Um, I do think we owe it to our staff to keep them safe and being in a large building with a bunch of unvaccinated children is not the best way to keep them safe. Um, it would also protect students that are at higher risk of COVID as well as their um, family members and their siblings as is the case in my house. I do have a son who is at higher risk for COVID and I'm concerned about his sister bringing it home to him if she's in a building with unmasked um, children. And lastly, the CDC and the AAP recommend masking for all children under 12 due to their inability to get the vaccine. Um, so thank you for considering all of that information and I appreciate your time. My name is Jennifer. I live at 31809 South Roundhead. Your last name, please. Oh, Emerino, sorry. Um, about a month ago, we all watched in horror as the condos in Florida collapsed, only to find that the owners of the condo had known for years that the building's infrastructure was severely damaged and needed repair. But rather than address the issue head on, they decided to ignore it, and it resulted in devastating consequences. Right now in this country, we are seeing our infrastructure start to collapse. The average life expectancy for a trans woman of color is 35 years old. That is a crumbling infrastructure. We have seen over 360 voter suppression bills introduced into legislation over the past year. That is a crumbling infrastructure. On average, less than 10% of class time is dedicated to black history and only 8% of graduating seniors can identify slavery as the root cause of the Civil War. Hate violent crimes have hit a 16 year high in this country. All examples of crumbling infrastructure. We can no longer look away and hope things will just magically get better on their own. After growing up in a predominantly white community and attending a largely white high school and college, I have learned a lot this past year that, has taught, that was never taught to me in my school. 
At no point in my quest for knowledge did I choose to feel sorry for myself or encourage my children to hate themselves or this country because of the problems we face in society. I chose to take the mindset of listening, learning, and trying to do what I could do to help. Every child that walks into the DEI classroom is allowed that choice of what they want to do with the information presented. So let's stop pretending that we are making white kids feel bad about themselves is anywhere close to a valid argument. The fact that anyone would feel that their child shouldn't learn how to be more compassionate, understanding, and accepting, or that other children should continue to walk through their lives feeling discriminated against, misunderstood, or excluded, simply because it might make their child feel a bit uncomfortable in the learning process is all the evidence we need of how vital these classes are, and probably further evidence that we need them for many adults as well. Understanding our history, understanding the cultures, lifestyles, and ideologies of our neighbors, colleagues, fellow students and friends doesn't have the power to make us hate ourselves or this country. These classrooms aren't indoctrination, they're information. Information that the student body overwhelmingly asked for, which should be the beginning and the ending of this debate. If we are going to fix the crumbling infrastructure, we need to do it by working together, by listening when people say there is a problem, by accepting that maybe we don't always have the answers and allowing the space to ev for everyone to grow stronger. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Lee Hall. I live at 7102 Fox Hill Drive in Solon. I want to begin by putting on record what I'm sure you already know, that boards of education have become ground zero for the fight to silence the racial justice movement born in the wake of George Floyd's murder. I ask you to remain strong in the face of the well-funded, well-organized, ruthless misinformation campaign being waged against our public schools. This movement is not narrowly tailored to some newly identified threat. Rather, it is a ruthlessly broad overreaction that seeks to silence and even criminalize all conversation about race, including longstanding, widely accepted cultural competency and diversity concepts. After the murder of George Floyd, I heard the call to learn about institutional and structural racism and what it means to be anti-racist. As an attorney and a social worker, I thought I had a good understanding of these issues. I quickly realized I only had a surface level understanding. And I learned about the structural and institutional racism, racism that creates real, measurable differences in life outcomes. As a white person, my response to this learning was not to hate myself or other white people. It was to hate the system. And, felt, and I felt motivated to see it changed. School districts across the country, including Solon, had the same reaction I had. They felt compelled to better understand what was happening and to do something to help support their staff, students, and communities. In Erin Short's June 11, 2020 email, she said, I believe our country is at a tipping point when it comes to race relations, and I also believe schools need to take a leadership role in helping students and families have honest and open conversations about race. I felt so grateful for this email. She got it, and I felt comforted to know that my students attended school in a district that got it. As a country, the cognitive dissonance between our ideals and our actions continues. So does the fight to resolve it. Providing our children with the education required to understand systemic and institutional racism will prepare them to be engaged citizens and future leaders. Casting this education as anti-white racism that targets individual people and not systems is disingenuous at best. Come on, let's give our, kids, child, our children credit for being able to learn hard things. The DEI curriculum was being developed well before the pandemic and George Floyd's murder. As people have already mentioned, it started in response to students feeling that, reporting that they were experiencing racism at school. And if nothing else, this matters. We asked and our children told us what they needed. They asked us to work to become anti-racist. I ask you to continue to support this effort. And I'm just responding also, because I have a few seconds left, to the first woman who spoke, because I am the parent of a pansexual child. And so I appreciate the inclusion of LGBTQ curriculum and appreciate that you've included it. Thank you. Good morning. 
Uh, I'm George Dent. Uh, I live at 32105 uh, Woodsdale Lane. I agree with those who have objected to the use of critical race theory and other radical racial doctrines in our schools. With my limited time, I will focus on the anti-racism glossary of terms that was given to students and only later was made available to parents. It's highly objectionable in many ways. Uh, because of time limits, I will focus on just two of them. Uh, one is the definition of white fragility. This is said to trigger the outward display of emotions such as anger and behavior such as argumentation. In other words, if you're irate about what you feel is a distorted and divisive treatment of race and respond by disagreeing, you are guilty of white fragility. Apparently, the only permissible response is abject acquiescence. Well, I think that open debate is not fragility. It is a sign of freedom and of a vigorous democracy. Uh, second is white privilege, which is often humiliating for white children, and I believe intended to humiliate them. Uh, this is outrageous. America today is the least racist major country in the world. Black people are freer and more prosperous in America than in any other country in the world. Do not take my word for this. Look at the behavior of black people and other people of color. Yes, millions of them are trying to cross our border. But you notice they're all trying to get in they are not trying to get out. Now, if the people who were propagating this anti-racism glossary of terms really meant what they say, they would be standing on our borders telling all these would-be immigrants, turn around, you're making a terrible mistake. This is a terrible racist country. Go somewhere else. In fact, they are encouraging people to come here. Why did they come here? One of the... Uh, microaggressions that we are not supposed to utter is that America is the land of opportunity. Why in the world are all these immigrants trying to come here? They are looking for opportunity, an opportunity that is more available to them in America than any other country in the world. So to the extent that any of us should have, now I realize I did not write the Declaration of Independence. You didn't write it, so I can't take credit for it. But, okay, I'm sorry, my time is up. Uh, I ask that the uh, board um, act on my request to uh, eliminate this glossary of terms as soon as possible, to apologize to the community for its having been put out, and to uh, issue a, a statement uh, uh, explaining the problems with this glossary and uh, stating what is going to be done to change it. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Jonathan Broadbent. I'm here for a second time with Protect Ohio Children. I wish we had a lot more time to discuss the subject of critical race theory, comprehensive sexuality education, and social emotional learning, all three of which I have uh, feel like I'm drinking from a fire hose. I've spent if the you last... Could state your, if you could state your address, please. My address is 3362 Belvoir Boulevard, Beachwood. I have... Uh, immersed myself in historical learning of critical theory, the Franklin School, and the origins of the belief systems and learning and curriculum associated with, among other things, critical race theory. I think it bears a brief recap of circumstances and how we got to the point where we're having this back and forth discussion. At some morning earlier this year, Solon School and Solon School Board and superintendent discovered that there is systemic racism. At the same time, major uh, sports franchises and several major corporations in America all discovered the same thing. And interestingly, all discovered that uh, there's one resource to go to to address this systemic racism. I'll focus just exclusively 
excuse, excuse me, on CRT this morning because it seems to be a very hot button issue in uh, Solon exclusively. Uh, Solon, among all school districts in the country, seems to have adopted unheard of resources in order to address the systemic racism that was discovered earlier this year. The problem I believe that you're facing is that parents were not communicated with, teachers were ineffectively communicated with, and students don't understand it. So my volunteer organization, and no, we do not, we're not well funded, and we have very little money. We're just people that are passionate about our kids and our communities and public school and education. Uh, we are being inundated with calls from teachers and students. One of them uh, from a Solon upper school student will be published on protectohiochildren.com. Solon is now redlined as a school that is adopting <clears throat> this material and uh, appears to be moving away from traditional curriculum. The outsourcing of this curriculum to a parent-teacher organization, keeping it effectively hidden from teachers, or from uh, parents rather, is counter to creating and uh, developing public trust, as some other parents have commented. I'm going to take the comments of one student and turn them into a discussion point, and it will be published. I imagine it will go live on Facebook and places like it. Last one we did had 135,000 comments on uh, YouTube, so watch for that, please. Good day. Catherine Catino, 33145 Rockford Drive. Mr. Bolden, when we spoke earlier this year about the DEI program, you shared with me that the PTA put this together with positive intent in mind and assured me and several other parents that critical race theory was not being taught. What you shared with us was encouraging, but during the last two board meetings, several members of the PTA stood up here and referred to their work as critical race theory. You stated that the materials were purposely withheld from the parents for the purpose of having, quote, organic conversations, but that we can always opt our kids out of the program. When I asked how can we opt our kids out if we don't know what is being taught first, you agreed with my point, and it sounds like that's changing now, so thank you. You stated that you reviewed and approved all the materials. So either the PTA snuck these definitions by you, or you approved these definitions to be taught, which means that you believe them to be facts. When Principal Short told me the teachings of Ibram Kendi were not being taught, one has to wonder, after seeing her June email recommending his book and handing out the glossary of anti-racist definitions. Either something nefarious is going on, or there's really bad communication between parents, the board, and administration. It breaks my heart that some in the community think that we don't want inclusion for our children, or that we don't want taught the bad and the ugly of our history. On the contrary, we are concerned that the last 53 years of history are being ignored, a time when many laws that fight systemic racism were implemented, such as the Federal Fair Housing Act, Civil Rights Act, Equal Employment Opportunity, and Affirmative Action. If these laws didn't work, then how is it that cities like Solon continue to become a more diverse community every year? We were also told by the PTA that the students love the lessons, not according to the high school DNI survey 2.0 results from this spring. Board, I know that you've read the feedback, the student feedback, and you read for yourself the comments from the students where they said the messaging was confusing, it appeared, only white, it, it appeared to only blame white people for racism, and now all they can think about is labels. <clears throat> when I heard one speaker last time say, quote, my goal is not to have them see color, but to have them understand what a person's color represents, end quote, I wasn't sure what that meant, but I can tell you that that is not my family's values. My goal is to teach my kids that color doesn't mean anything, and that is okay for us to disagree. It is not okay for the administration and the PTA to use public school to teach their values to other people's children. On the one hand, the PTA and the principal appear to be influenced by and referencing Kendi's book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, for some of the materials. Why haven't we seen a recommendation for the book, Woke Racism, by John McWhorter? To be clear, 
We are not against inclusion, but we are very concerned about the lack of diversity of thought within these materials and that children are being taught racist ideas. Thank you. Hello, my name is Kristen Eshman. I live at 34525 Sherwood Drive, Stolen. Before I begin, I want to thank the board and the school system for the phenomenal job they did last year keeping our kids safe during the pandemic. I'm here today to show support for the mask mandate in students under age 12. And I know Solon has not made a determination yet. Solon's protocols should be in accordance with the CDC and the AAP guidelines, especially in light of Delta and that these kids cannot be vaccinated yet. My six-year-old understands that everybody's trying to do their part to combat this awful thing. And he's so proud and happy to do his little part by just wearing a mask to contribute to this fight. And he's not alone in his sentiment. We have over 200 people on a petition having um, is in support of mandatory masks for this age group. If no mandate is possible, at the very least, perhaps optional um, individual classrooms requiring masks and other classrooms with optional masks. And I know how difficult this can be with class balancing, but it was done last year. You guys did a great job with separate classes in each grade who did virtual schooling. Really, the health and safety need to come first and then the academics. So let's think outside the box here. A mandate or individual classrooms would help eliminate mask shaming and bullying as well. And I know there's no current legislation that states anything about masks yet, so perhaps we start the school year with that. Uh, we would be trading off the well-being of the people in our community to appease a vocal minority. Now make no mistake, there's people here in this room that, can, that will make decisions that could result in serious health consequences. There is a recommendation from the scientific and medical community. Now while it may be inconvenient and will lead to a group of passionate local critics, you are taking the high road and you are very well saving lives. So on school board, I hope you make the right choice, the, the safe choice, and it won't be the easy choice. Thank you. Julie. We are at 30 minutes. Oh. Well, at this time, um, we have reached our 30 minutes. Um, it is at the purview of the board. We can vote um, to extend this period of time since we would like to give everyone the opportunity to speak. So um, I will entertain a motion to extend the period of time um, at this for the next group, and then um, we can move on from there if we have to do that. We'll a motion for another 15? Well, at least 15. Okay. 15 minutes? At, or more. 15 minutes. And we'll do it every day. Okay. We have a motion. That's can I have a second? second? Please call the roll, please. Um, Ms. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Heckman? Yes. Mr. Patton? Yes. Mrs. Moses? Yes. Mrs. Glavin? Yes. Good morning. My name is Lori Chandar. I live at 34781. Just one moment, Lori. Sure. Go ahead. I live at 34781 Southside Park Drive in Solon. I'm also here to support a mandate for masks for children who are ineligible to be vaccinated. Uh, I don't have a prepared speech, but what I do will say is that my husband is an ICU nurse. I work in subacute rehab. We've been dealing with this since last March. For a lot of people in the community, it's over. Every, I see a lot of people out without masks. I feel we are still masking. My husband is in the ICU. The numbers are definitely trending up. The people in the ICU are younger and they're very sick. Um, for me, working in rehab, I'm seeing people taking a really long time to recover, some very sick people. So I'm just very concerned about my six-year-olds going to school without a mask at this point um, because I just feel like we owe it to our children to protect them and also the teachers and, you know, anybody in the school. Um, this virus is so much more transmissible and it's, and it's really making a lot of people sick and it's just really important for me to feel that my child is safe when she goes to school. I feel that, that masks should be mandated, at least for the beginning of the school year until the CDC would make other requirements. Thank you. Olga Polner, 5780 Janet Boulevard. Hello, like my husband Michael, who spoke at the last meeting, I came from the former Soviet Union as a Jewish refugee 27 years ago. I might never know how specific minority groups in America feel, but I believe I had my fair share of experience of being in an underprivileged minority group. When I was about five years old, my grandmother summoned me for a talk. 
by the tone of her voice, I knew she meant serious business. She told me, you have to remember that we are Jewish and people around don't like us. Always be mindful of what you say. Never voice your opinion in public or it will be turned against you. The only safe place you have is your home. Tough reality. Being shy by nature, I faithfully followed the advice for the rest of my life in the Soviet country. I quietly swallowed all the derogatory remarks and actions toward me or my Jewish friends. Once in high school, a pretty nice girl from my class came into a locker room full of my classmates and announced that she wanted to tell us a hilarious joke. I was ready to laugh. The joke went like this. A man is walking down the street and shouting, put all Jews in caskets. Another man replied, but there are some good Jews. The first man answers, of course, put good Jews in good caskets. Everybody laughed. So to fast forward, when I came to the US and saw how friendly and accommodating American people were toward Jewish community, I relaxed and embraced my new reality. One day at work, my coworker, a nice older woman who occupied the next, next cubicle, came from a meeting with somebody in a different department. She was irritated. Something went wrong. She came to me and started, to vent, started venting. You know, such and such is very unpleasant to work with. It's because she is Jewish. Here we go. I had 20 seconds to decide. We've already been through the diversity and inclusion training, and my complaint to HR could probably leave this woman out of a job. I thought quickly, what will I gain by reporting her? I said, you know, I'm Jewish too. All individuals are different. That was it. We became good friends. I forgave her prejudice and she learned her lesson. What scares me the most in the recent development with school education and work policies is that human element is being taken out of the equation and snitching and labeling is being encouraged and rewarded. Also, the mentality of victimhood is being nurtured in minority groups. Everything and everyone becomes suspicious and hostile if you see yourself as a victim. But sometimes a simple human conversation can solve a problem. Nobody argues that violent behavior or bullying coming from any individual or a group has to be stopped immediately and with all strictness. But ruining someone's career, good name, and future for one stupidly repeated joke or not thought through comment is an absolute nonsense that will only lead to divisiveness and hatred. Thank you. Thank you. Scott Embacher, 33905 Blue Heron Drive. I have uh, two kids that are going to be a freshman and a sixth grader in Solon, and they happen to be black. They were both adopted from Ethiopia when they were one. I want to tell you a couple stories about them, um, it, it, their experience in Solon. Overwhelmingly positive, for sure, but in second grade, my son was trying to get on the bus, and he was trying to find a seat, and a kid said, uh, you can't sit here. We don't let black kids sit here. And when we talked to the principal, the principal said, well, that really wasn't a seat anyway. And then a couple years later, uh, someone said to him, you know what, you need to go to, back to Africa because you probably have Ebola. And then a couple years after that, a uh, referee had to stop a soccer game because of some racially charged things that were being said to my son. Um, it had to just stop the game with a few minutes left because the refs knew that it couldn't go on. I heard in the last meeting, and it's my first board meeting, but I read that people said, we just need <coughs> to teach the facts. Well, here's the deal. We're no longer in the just the facts economy. We're now in the knowledge economy. We're now in the wisdom economy. We're now in the relationship economy. So we can teach the fact that Rosa Parks uh, didn't give up her seat to uh, start the Montgomery bus boycott. But if we don't analyze how those uh, lessons still prevail to those attitudes still prevail today, we're doing our kids a disservice. We can teach about how the fact how the infectious disease spreads but if we're not seeing, um, analyzing the health disparities in our world, then certainly we can't move our society forward. And for the sports example, certainly there's not a fact within schools that might teach that. And that's why this diversity education is so important, because that carries on and teaches our kids what it truly means to be part of a team. The problem with the just the facts argument is there's millions of facts out there, and I can find them in two seconds on my phone. It doesn't take me that long. Um, and if we teach our kids just the facts, and we're going to be taken over by automation. Uh, if we don't teach our kids how to interpret facts and use critical thinking skills, we're not preparing them for the work world. And this isn't to make anybody feel bad. Uh, not at all, and just the opposite. This is to show our kids how they can be the hero in the story. This is not a matter of white guilt. This is a matter of all of us coming together and make sure that our kids grow up in a better, better world than they inherited. 
This is why people move to Solon. This is why we move to Solon, because it most closely mirrored the world that we want our kids to enter after graduation. Here's a fact about today's economy coming from myself. I'm a principal of a school in Cleveland who's talked to many employers who are lining up to hire graduates who are culturally responsive in the global business world. Those graduates who understand the need to build partnerships with those from different cultures and have the ability to build relationships will have jobs that are more lucrative and stable than those whose niche only includes those who look and act like they do. Let me tell you one other thing. I told you some pretty rough stories at the beginning of my three minutes, but guess what? None of those things have happened in the past year. Someone said last me that these lessons weren't having the intended effect. I am here to tell you that they are making a difference. We moved to Solon because Solon is as representative of the global community as we could find. If talking about this rich diversity in a direct way is uncomfortable for others, there are dozens of other communities that choose not to talk about the beauty of our global diverse village. As for this community, I choose to live here because of it. Good morning. My name is Kathy Lackick and I'm at 32250 Burlwood Drive. Uh, while I appreciate your service to our school and the effort to help our community remain safe and healthy, I do have concerns with the decisions made by our schools this past year and truly hope you'll be able and willing to put some time and consideration into advocating for a solution to this concern. My son excelled in the environment provided to him at Parkside for two years and was able to meet many of his IEP goals, enough to move him into an essentials class at Lewis for this last school year, um, of which I, I had to pull him out because accommodations were not um, able to be made for him. So unfortunately, the environment laid out within Solon's last reopening plan was highly disturbing to me as a parent but specifically as a mother of a child with special needs. The environment of forced masking, face shields, social distancing, germophobia, plexiglass, et cetera, did not provide the least restrictive nor healthiest environment for my son. And I did not believe his IEP goals were able to be met under such conditions. In fact, I believed he would regress with the lack of, lack of transition and normalcy. Medically, my son is unable to wear a mask and will not tolerate a face shield. He has had multiple reconstructive surgeries on his mouth and nose, which have affected his airways and resulted in facial sensory issues. He is also on the autism spectrum and has sensory issues. Masking, I believe, is dehumanizing as it interferes with the ability to communicate social cues, such as smiling and frowning. They are distracting and can impact learning. Masks could lead to the spread of more germs from students constantly adjusting them. They trigger anxiety and fear, and they are uncomfortable and reduce oxygen levels in the blood. Students like my son that receive special education services, OT, PT, and special services uh, may not be able to adhere to the strict physical distancing requirements. Um, I also believe that the new normal is psychologically and physically damaging to all children. It is creating an isolationist environment leading to high depression and suicide rates amongst our children. Um, I am asking that you please consider leaving the decision to mask or unmask to the parent or guardian of the child. Thank you. Hello, my name is Michael Dobson, 5701 Spring Grove Drive. <coughs> I start? Yeah. OK, well, last time I was here, um, I was impressed by some speakers, and even today, um, uh, telling us how privileged they are uh, based on the color of their skin. Yet besides preaching us on what we should feel and do, they seem to do nothing of value for the underprivileged community. If you really and truly want to help, if you feel you, your children lack diversity, move to a more diverse school district. You have the freedom to do so. You live in the United States. Actually, most countries, even, even uh, like Germany and France, you are assigned a certain place to live. You cannot move. But you will never do such a thing because you want to give your children 
the advantages of privileged upbringing. You want your children to become as privileged as possible. But it is not fair to underprivileged. And that is why you feel guilty. And now you're trying to impose your sense of guilt onto the rest of us. I moved to Solon School District because I wanted my children to go to the best school possible. I could care less who were their, their co-students, even if they were Martians or moonwalkers. I don't care. I, pay, I moved to Solon. I work literally seven days a week for the, since I was 18 years old to make sure my children have the opportunity that Solon School provides them. And that opportunity is an education. It has nothing to do with the color of anybody's skin. I paid more, more taxes. I put, paid for more for my house just to uh, afford them that such an opportunity. I do not want my children to be taught anything but the fact-based curriculum. And it is very hypocritical for other people to tell me how to feel and uh, how to approach people. Last time also, there was a lady here, uh, Bridget Clay Caver, and her, her daughter was here. She was telling us how when she moved to, to the white, predominantly white neighborhood, uh, there, there were some incidents of uh, bombs. And yeah, that was all true 50 years ago. It hasn't been so. And even 10 years ago, when I moved to Solon, there were no such issues. There was a lady here who, was, who has a multiracial family who has not experienced it until recently when you started teaching this, all these divisive things like uh, inclusion and DIY and uh, race, critical race theory. It has all of these issues have been resolved a long time ago. And in an individual case, yes, some people are going to be racist. Some people are, are not going to like you. And that's OK. Move on. Am I done? That's it. You can. So anyway, I guess that I, I, I'm out of time. Thank you for your time. Hi, Neil Gloger, 302 Seven Oak Cannon Road. I'm really nervous. My entire life, I've been discriminated against. I'm fat. I'm a little slow. I was always picked last for, the, for a sports team. I was over, always overlooked at dances. And I feel really bad about it. And none of that is a community's responsibility. If I had one thing to say, I would say that your job is to provide a free and appropriate public education. I, I disagree with a fact-based curriculum because really our job is to teach our children how to analyze the facts in front of them and make the best decisions possible with those facts. It's not the community's job really to help people with low self-esteem. It's, it's just not. It's a family's job. It's a parent's job. Critical race theory is, as we all know, or some of you should know by now, is simply an extension of critical theory. But the proponents of it can't use it. The last instance of critical theory that was a, an example on the face of the earth was Paul Pot. I don't know if anybody remembers him. It's not a band from the 70s. But he killed millions of people based on critical theory. Mao, I, we could go on and on. So the proponents can't use critical theory. They've boiled down to simply race. All they have left is divisiveness by race because economics aren't working any. They've, they've already proven that critical theory and economics doesn't work. I think it's important to look at the origins of all of this and decide, is this part of a free and appropriate public education. I, I think it's not. I think it's not the. I I I I think that if we extrapolate how I felt growing up, that it's not enough to be a skinny person and say you know that's just their lifestyle. It's okay. It's fair. No, you we would have to make skinny people fat and slow and lethargic, and to eat inappropriately. In, in, in order to identify and be okay with fat people. 
And it's the same with whatever's going on race-wise. It's a, it's a ridiculous self-esteem issue on the part of Kendi and, and, and on the part of modern liberal thought. This is like an Achilles heel of modern liberal thought because you can't disagree with somebody who is against racism. Everybody is against, it's self-evident, right? It's self-evident to, to disagree with racism. Anti-racism isn't what it sounds like. Anti-racism is a political term. Am I done? I'm not done, but we'll continue next time. And before we go, what to consider is, is this part of a free and appropriate public education? Thank you. It is not. Hi, uh, I'm Andrea Berland. I live at 34585 Blue Heron Drive. Um, I am a clinical psychologist. I work with kids and families all the time. And one thing I know from 20 years of being a psychologist is that the only way we address issues, move forward, and not get stuck is by having conversations about difficult things. And a lot of the things that I talk about with the kids and families I work with are their automatic thoughts, their biases, how they view the world. And if we don't talk about those things, if we deny them, we get stuck. We experience anxiety and depression and families have conflict. I've had three kids come through the Solon School District. They have had an incredibly diverse peer group in terms of racial background, ethnic background, religious background, sexual identity, gender identity. And the thing that I love about Solon is that they've had the chance to know these kids. But what my kids may not understand is that when their friends go out into the world, they are treated differently than my children are because of the color of their skin, because of their religious background, because of how they, who they want to love or who they, how they feel in their body. DEI is a great way for these kids to discuss these very important and difficult issues, to confront these thoughts that are there, that exist in our community. Our country was born with a very difficult history. And only through understanding that history and understanding how it informs how we view people today and think about things today, will our kids be able to identify how it has impacted them and then choose how to change their behavior. We can't stop our automatic thoughts, but we can choose how to behave and how to act once we have them. And these discussions help them to identify how our history and how our society impacts them today. So please, I encourage someone to continue with the DEI. And I just have one other clarifying thing. No one teaches critical race theory. Critical race theory is a very specific topic that is taught in law school. It is not taught on any high school curriculum in this country, and it is a dog whistle. And I just had to point that out because it infuriates me every time I hear it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Laura Cohen, 5585 Harper Road, Solon. Um, I'm here to be supportive, but I also wanted to just um, express my concern um, for this coming school year, at least for the beginning of it. Um, the fact that we're asking all of our students to come back in person and be in the building, um, which is probably best educationally for the vast majority of them. Um, but there's a big group up, th up to age 12 that is not eligible yet to be vaccinated um, against the pandemic, which is still around, it's still happening. There's still people sick and dying and it's spreading. Um, and I just don't feel that it's safe to put all of these unvaccinated students into classrooms and allow them to not be masked. And I understand that um, Solon has followed the uh, recommendations of the Cuyahoga County Board of Health. Um, and I'm just hoping that they'll make the recommendation that that is safest for the children and that the schools will follow suit. Um, thank you.
seeing no other public comment, we'll move along in our meeting. Those of you who have spoken, if you would like to leave, you're certainly welcome to do that. If you'd like to stay, you may do that. There'll be another portion of public comment later in the meeting. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for coming in. It was nice. Thank you, Mr. Dent. Thank you. <laughs> At this time, we'll continue on with our meeting. We're moving into the treasurer's report. Item A1, approval of minutes. Recommended motion to approve the minutes of the regular meeting of June 30, 2021. May I have a motion, please? Move. Moved by second. Mrs. Thomas, second by Mr. Patton. Are there any additions or corrections to the minutes? Seeing none, Mr. Bolden, will you call the model, please? Yes. Uh, Ms. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Heckman? Yes. Mr. Patton? Yes. Mrs. Moses? Yes. Ms. Glebb? Yes. Uh, Ms. Glebb, before you continue, uh, the motion in the second? Uh, yes. It was Mr. Patton? And Mr. Patton. Mr. Patton and? Okay. Our, our treasurer is, is on vacation this week, so we're kind of having a different I'm, arrangement. I'm, I'm, I'm pitch hitting today. Right. So I'm pitch hitting for the treasurer so, today. We so, so we're working into this here. Um, item A2, approval of bills. Recommended motion to approve the payment of bills totaling $8,438.12 as noted in closure A2. So moved. Moved by Mr. Heckman, second, second by Mrs. Moses. Mr. Uh, Bolden, your, your other hat. <laughs> yes, there we go. Uh, these bills are uh, all security related. Um, we, we had a non public one as well, but they're all security related improvements and uh, bills. Good, thank you. Are there any questions? We'll call the roll, please. Mrs. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Heckman? Yes. Mr. Patton? Yes. Mrs. Moses? Yes. Mrs. Glavin? Yes. Concludes our treasurer's report. Moving into the superintendent's report. Item B1, assistant to the athletic director and strength and conditioning coach hire. Recommended motion to hire John Dunn as the assistant to the athletic director slash strength and conditioning coach as noted in enclosure B1. Motion, please. Move. Moved by Mrs. Thomas, second by Mr. Patton. Mrs. Thomas, Patton. Uh, yes, Mr. Dunn is, uh, as, as you'll recall, um, we had lost our strength and conditioning mm -hmm. coach to a private parochial school. Uh, that uh, decided to move closer to his family to go through that. And while we miss him, we are really excited to have Mr. Dunn. He has a great pedigree. He's a, he's a young guy, really excited to, to get in there and, and continue the work to help all of our athletes uh, prepare. Uh, as you know, uh, strength and conditioning is the thing that we can use that really helps to minimize injury when our kids get on the field later on. It really helps them for their overall well-being, and uh, we're really excited to have him here with us. He has a great pedigree, and we're excited to have him on board. Great, thank you. Are there any questions, comments? Seeing none, Mr. Bolden, would you call the roll, please? Yes, Mrs. Moses? Yes. Mr. Patton? Yes. Mr. Heckman? Yes. Mrs. Thomas? Yes. Mrs. Glavin? Yes. Item B2, employment contract addendum, Antoine Campbell. Recommended motion to approve a contract addendum in the amount of $2,000 for services rendered as acting principal of Solon Middle School for Ju June and July 2021, as noted in enclosure B2. Motion, please. So moved. Moved by Mr. Heckman, seconded by Mrs. Moses. Uh, yes, uh, uh, in the interim, when after Scott left, but before uh, Antoine kept his contract and we hired on our new person which starts in August there was a period of time where Antoine has been doing both his job as well as the job of the prince uh, the assistant principal and he's been working a lot of nights and so this is just to compensate mm -hmm. him for that time that he's been doing both roles Brilliant. thank you any questions mr. Bolden yes Mrs. Thomas yes mr. Heckman yes mr. Patton yes mrs. Moses yes Ms. Glavin yes Item B3, B3, retire, rehire, OPSI. Recommended motion to retire retired employee Darlene Hillis for one year as noted in the collective bargaining agreement between the Solon Board of Education and the Ohio Association of Public School Employees complying with Ohio Revised Code 3307.353. 3, 3, 3, 0, 3. Motion, please. Moved. Moved by Mr. Patton. Second. Second by Mrs. Moses. Uh, yes, Mrs. Hillis has worked for us for quite a, a period of years, and, and now, as per the contract, we have the ability to have 
we have the ability to have um, her rehire for an additional year. It will save her the time from, it will save her time, it will save us money, and it will save her, and it really works out for everybody. So she will be rehiring her, and she'll be able to move on from there. Thank you. Call the roll, please. Mrs. Thomas. Yes. Mr. Heckman. Yes. Mr. Patton. Yes. Mrs. Moses. Yes. Mrs. Glavin. Yes. Item B4, classified retirement. Recommend a motion to approve the retirement of Maria Principe, custodian for Solon Mill, excuse me, Solon Preschool, effective October 1, 2021. Maria has been with the district for 29 years. May I have a motion, please? Move. Moved by Mrs. Thomas. Second. Seconded by Mrs. Moses. Yes, uh, Maria's worked for us for many, many years. We're really excited Indeed. to, she, she really has. She's done a great job for us. We're gonna miss her. Um, and we're really excited that she's gonna be taking that next step in her life. So we're really happy for her. Good, thank you. We certainly do wish her well. Is there any comments or questions? Seeing none, call the roll, please. Mrs. Thomas. Yes. Mr. Patton. Yes. Mrs. Moses. Yes. Mr. Heckman. Yes. And Mrs. Glavin. Yes. Item B5, certified resignations. Recommended motion to approve the resignations of Sianas Johnson, Spanish teacher at Solon High School, Cheryl Roth, art, art teacher at Lewis Elementary, and Kelly Zorowski, science teacher at Solon High School, effective August 31, 2021. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Moved Second. by Mrs. Moses, seconded by Mr. Patton. Uh, yes, all three of these teachers have uh, been able to find, uh, one of them is going to be a principal in another school district. Um, another one uh, has a job for uh, the Cleveland Art Institute, and then we have another one who has a job in her backyard, close to her home. She's been making a very large commute. We're going to miss all three of them. They're all really Indeed, great yes. teachers. Uh, we wish them well. Thank you. Any questions, no. Mr. Mr. Bolden? Um, Mrs. Thomas. Yes. Mr. Patton. Yes. Mrs. Moses. Yes. Mr. Heckman. Yes. Mrs. Glavin. Yes. Supplemental contracts, recommended motion to approve supplemental contracts to the following individuals, and they are listed below. Vote. We have a motion, please, Mr. Patton. Second. Second by Mrs. Thomas. Uh, yes, these are all uh, supplemental contracts for the beginning of the school year. These are covering things like our mentors uh, that are mentoring new teachers in the district, as well as some football and other sports activities that we have not filled yet. Uh, there's no new positions here or additional positions that are all replacing existing positions that were there. Good, thank you. Any questions? Mr. Bolden? Yes, Mrs. Thomas. Yes. Mr. Heckman. Yes. Mr. Patton. Yes. Mrs. Moses. Yes. Mrs. Glavin. Yes, thank you. Um, item B7, new hires. Recommended motion to hire the following individuals as teachers for the 2021-22 school year, and they are listed below. We have a motion, please. So move. Moved by Mr. Heckman. Second. Second by Mrs. Thomas. Yes, these are uh, several of these people are to replace some of those people that had resigned, and they are coming on. They're coming on to work for the district. Uh, we're excited to have them. Uh, they have all been vetted, and we're ready to have them join the team. Great, thank you. Any other questions, Mr. Bolton? Yes, Mrs. Thomas. Yes. Mr. Heckman. Yes. Mr. Patton. Yes. Mrs. Moses. Yes. Mrs. Glavin. Yes. Item B eight substitutes recommended motion to approve the following individuals as substitutes on an as-needed basis for the 2021-22 school year, as noted in enclosure B8. May I have a motion, please? Move. Move by Mrs. Thomas. Second. Second by Mrs. Moses. Yes, these are substitute teachers for the year. If you're interested in being a substitute, our applications are online so that you can fill that out and come to work for us. We will need substitutes this year. We had a dearth of them last year and it really hurt us and we would really like to have a, a strong number of them for this build year as well. Build our numbers back up. We want to build our numbers back up, absolutely. Great, thank you. Any questions? Mr. Bolden? Mrs. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Patton? Yes. Mrs. Moses? Yes. Mr. Heckman? Yes. Mrs. Glavin? Yes. Item B9, Ohio Schools Council. Recommend a motion to approve an agreement between the Solon Board of Education and the Ohio Schools Council in the amount of $7,266 and 51 cents for programs and ministers through the Ohio Schools Council as noted in enclosure B9. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Moved move by Mr. Heckman, second by Mrs. Moses. Uh, yes, the Ohio Schools Council is a program that we use every single year. 
they do many services for us that we would have to hire out for ourselves. We would have to, uh, one example such of that is our bus bidding. We would have to design the specifications for our buses, send them out to the various vendors, identify who those people are going to be, determine who was the lowest responsible bidder and then select them. What Ohio Schools Council does is it enables us to put all of that aside. They've helped us tremendously through the pandemic with helping us to secure goods and services that uh, by negotiating lower prices for us for many of the things because of group purchasing power to go through it, uh, they help us with our uh, utility bills. It's a great service, uh, lots of education opportunities, and it's a great service to the community and to the district in particular. Are there any questions? Call the roll, please. Mr. Thomas. Mrs. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Heckman? Yes. Mr. Patton? Yes. Mrs. Moses? Yes. Mrs. Glavin? Yes. Item B10, non-district people activity permit. Recommend a motion to approve a non-district people activity permit contract to the following individual. That listed below. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Moved by Mrs. Moses, okay. second by Mrs. Thomas. Uh, yes, this is a replacement for uh, one of our coaches that we had lost and um, we're happy to have them on board. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Call the roll, please. Mrs. Moses? Yes. Mr. Patton? Yes. Mr. Heckman? Yes. Mrs. Thomas? Yes. Mrs. Glavin? Yes. Item B11, tuition reimbursements. Recommend a motion to approve tuition reimbursements to the following individuals, and they are listed below. Moved. Moved by Mr. Patton? Second. Second by Mrs. Moses. Mrs. Glavin, these were previously approved, and they do meet our district criteria. Thank you. Are there any questions? Mr. Bolden? Mr. Patton? Yes. Mrs. Thomas? Yes. Mrs. Moses? Yes. Mr. Heckman? Yes. Mrs. Glavin? Yes, thank you. That concludes our business agenda. Moving into information items and other reports to the board. At this time, if do you have anything additionally, Mr. Bolden? Uh, no, Mrs. Glavin. Mrs. Siegel? No, Mrs. Glavin. Mr. Patton? Thank you. Mrs. Thomas? Not really. I was just happy to see we got seating done at uh, the preschool. Yes, we did. Nice to see. It is. We've got seating done. Uh, we are fixing up many of the things. You can see the memorial garden is done. Looks we will, awesome, by the way. It will look spectacular by the time school starts. There's still more work to be done, obviously. But we had to. We we like many like many businesses. We have had an employee shortage. Um, in the summer, we usually bolster our ranks for. Um, our maintenance crews this year, we were not able to secure additional workers for that. So we've been working double time. We brought in a third party company to help us Great. support our existing Great. people. So. Great, thank you. Mr. Beckman? Nothing at this time. Mrs. Moses. Not today, thanks. Thank you very much. Um, this is our second opportunity for public comment. If anyone has anything they'd like to bring to the board, please step to the microphone. Seeing none at this time. Oh, wait. Oh, we got one. Oh. I like how you try to end that, though. <laughs> I didn't see you running. We didn't see you coming up. Sorry. No, I don't blame you. I, man, this could have been a 10 minute meeting, I see. <laughs> Everybody totally left after the exciting stuff when we got down to the real business school. Well, that stuff a, as a principal, I was. It is a business meeting. I was as intrigued about the, the rest of the meeting as the first. So, just a couple follow ups. Um, I want to say a lot of people had commented that the parents should be the ones who teach them and the fact that I've seen with my kids in the school is it's not always happening at home and, and that's just reality with, with a lot of things that schools are expected to do it's not always fair that schools have to take on the, all these responsibilities but it is our reality and if we don't do it as a schools nobody will and those kind of things it gives my kids the language to handle those issues I know the one woman spoke very passionately and she said um, we seem to have these conversations, and I agree with her. And some of these lessons give uh, my kids the language that allows them to, to work through some of those issues. Um, and then the whole, why are we lined up to come to our country? Um, of course, once we're here, there's still challenges, and, and we have a responsibility to fix them. And just because they're here to line up to come to our country, once we're here, I feel we have a responsibility to, to make it the, the, the country we want it to be. And just as a side note, I'm probably the rare person who is for DEI, but it doesn't really want my kids wearing masks. Let me tell you why. Thank you. I, well, 30 more seconds, actually. That's all I need. <laughs> and you guys can it's go trying home to be on, equal. Go home on your July. <laughs> we, have to be, we have to be fair. It's supposed to be boring July board meeting. Um, OK, so if the vaccination, it, the kids are not affected um, as far as dying, of course, in COVID. There's, I think, zero reports of kids picking it up at school and dying um, 
adults at this point have had every opportunity to get the vaccine, so it's the adults who are the most affected. So my kid, if he gets COVID, is obviously not going to be as affected. Um, the masks in the, in the spring weren't to protect my kiddos, protect those who are in vulnerable populations. I believe all the vulnerable populations at this point has had the opportunity to get vaccinated. So if they've chosen not to get vaccinated, that's certainly their right. But at this point, they've left themselves susceptible. And I would prefer my kids. I think his educational experience is better when he doesn't have to wear his mask. That's all. It was Scott, right? That's right. Scott. OK, I just wanted to make sure in my notes. This town no pauses or boos or anything. I know. <laughs> 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 yeah, well, okay. All right, we could, we could clap for you there. <laughs> <laughs> this is a big crowd. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is usually a big crowd. Yeah, really. That's all right. There you go. Thank you again for coming in. Um, at, at this point, um, I will entertain a motion for the board to move in, into executive session for the purpose of, one, the appointment, employment, dismissal, discipline, promotion, demotion, or compensation of public employees or regulated individuals or the investigation of charges or complaints against a public employee or regarded or regulated individual unless such a person requests a public hearing. Also, number two, to consider the purchase of property if premature disclosure of information would give an unfair competitive bargaining advantage to a person whose private interest is adverse to the general public interest. And for reason number three, conferences with attorney concerning disputes involving pending and imminent or imminent court action. Of a motion, please. Moved. Moved by Mrs. Moses, second, second by Mrs. Thomas. Um, I would also mention that there will be no business. There will be no business conducted during this meeting, and no action will be taken. Um, may, would you call the roll, please? Yes, Mrs. Thomas. Yes. Mr. Heckman. Yes. Mrs. Glavin. Yes. Mr. Patton. Yes. Mrs. Moses. Yes. Okay.